I don't claim him as my son now, and I do not claim Stoney as my daughter. I have two children. That's it. Stephen and Stoney are demons. Period. I don't feel no remorse for the death of them demons. Abuse as a child can be extremely detrimental to the development of the brain. Research shows that child abuse is associated with structural abnormalities of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is part of the brain that connects the two hemispheres so they can communicate with each other. Conduct disorder, also known as CD, is associated with abnormalities of the corpus callosum. Conduct disorder is characterized by aggressive, deceptive, and destructive behavior. Today's video is about Michelle Blair, a mother who would murder two of her four children after her youngest child accused them of sexually abusing him. Michelle herself was sexually abused as a child, and we will see her exhibit many of the traits of conduct disorder. Today's video will also show how family, friends, and the system failed Michelle's children at the hands of such a wicked person. In most states in the U.S., a parent must give the government a notice of intent to homeschool a child before pulling the child from school. However, there are 11 states that don't require any notice or follow-up contact with the government when a parent homeschools a child. The point of the state knowing that you intend to homeschool your child is important in keeping an eye on your child's well-being. A risk factor for abuse is isolation. An abusive parent that is not held accountable by a third party, such as a school or the government, can be extremely dangerous. Michelle Blair was a mother of four children, who she had with two different men, as shown in the diagram. The youngest was Matthew, followed by Stephen, who shared the same father. She then had her third child, Stoney, followed by Gabrielle, who shared the same father. Throughout the video, we will also hear Matthew and Gabrielle referred to by their nicknames, Maddie and Gabby. Michelle and her children resided in an apartment building that was infested with roaches and mold. The four children did not have an escape from the conditions since she homeschooled them for the last couple years that she had custody of them. In 2015, Michelle received an eviction notice for failing to pay her house bills on time. She could not keep a job and had been receiving government financial assistance for her four children for many years. The eviction crew entered her house and started to remove her furniture. In the living room, they found a deep freezer. When they opened it, they found the body of two children, Stephen, who was nine years old, and Stoney, who was 13 years old at the time of their deaths. The bodies were stacked on top of one another inside of the freezer. The bodies of the children were kept inside this freezer in the middle of the living room for years, all while Michelle and her two children lived in the house. As a side note, this image of a freezer shown on screen has been floating around the internet, and some people think it's associated with this case. But a reverse image search reveals that it predates the events of this case, so it is not an accurate representation of where the bodies were kept. It took a few days for the bodies to thaw, so an autopsy could be performed. It was discovered that Stefan died about two and a half years before the eviction crew found his body, and Stoney had been dead for about a year and a half. We will now go back to the time when the murders took place. Stephen was killed in August 2012. One day in August, Michelle came home and saw her youngest son, Matthew, playing with dolls in an inappropriate manner. She asked him if anyone had done those things to him, and he replied, yes, Stephen did. Michelle marched to Stephen's room to confront him. In the following clip of Michelle's confession during her trial, we will hear Michelle recount the horrendous abuse she inflicted on Stephen after the doll incident. She will go on to say that she beat him and suffocated him until he was unconscious many times for two weeks following the incident, until he succumbed to his injuries. So I started punching Stephen. You know, I'm, I'm like, what the fuck is you doing to him? I just, I just started asking him questions. Matthew at this point is just spilling out. He's just spilling out. And mom, and he's doing like this, and he do this thing almost every night. He tell me how he was, the reason I put bags over Stephen's head is because if we had Maddie, I thought Maddie peed in the bed. My son was never a bad water. Didn't know it was Stephen waking up every morning pissing on Matthew. The reason I put bags over Stephen's head is because my son told me that the plastic on his bed, because I thought he was a bad water, he said, sometimes, Mom, I couldn't breathe. Stephen was laying on me, and he had my face down in the plastic on the bed. I couldn't breathe. That's when I got a garbage bag and started putting it over Stephen's head. And I started asking him, you know what I'm saying? You see what this feel like? You can't breathe? You stop at my... That's my son. 
You could not breathe on top of getting raped. You were six years old at the time. You get what I'm saying? So I put a bag over his head. He lost consciousness. I did that a couple times. Um, he told me that Matty, Matty would be face down. He had stuff around his neck. So I grabbed Steven and I grabbed the belt and I put a belt around his neck and I lifted him up like, do you like how this feels? Being choked with a belt. So I dropped him. I held him up until he lost consciousness as well. You were intending to... No, I did not intend to kill Steven. No, but... no, no. I'm not... Listen to my question. You were intending to inflict serious physical harm, but not kill him. Definitely. Okay. Matthew, the youngest child, outlined in detail to his mother the abuse he claimed to endure from his older brother, Stephen. This fueled the abuse Michelle inflicted on Stephen. She tried to replicate the pain she believed her son endured. Michelle tells the judge she used scolding hot water to burn Stephen and forced him to drink Windex. According to Matthew, Stephen used this same form of torture on him. Stephen forced Matthew to drink Windex, which made him sick, and Michelle brushed it off as a stomach bug at the time. You talked about choking him. Did you also burn him? Yes, I did. Okay, how did you do that? Hot water. Scalding hot water. In our bathroom, the hot, the hot water gets extremely hot. So, um, his private area, I stood him in the bathtub naked. Did you his also make came him off. drink Windex? Yes, I did, because Matthew told me in the middle of the night, he had took him in the basement, and he made him drink the blue stuff from under the sink. And I'm like, what? What blue stuff? So I walked Maddie downstairs. He showed me what I said. You made Maddie drink fucking Windex. And then I went back to like years before. And I'm like, is this what was wrong with him? I thought Matthew had the stomach flu. Where you vomit and have diarrhea. You get what at the same time? This is At that time, this is what was going around. A lot of people had it. So this is what I thought Matthew had. He didn't. Stephen made him drink Windex. So yes, I made that boy drink Windex. At this point, Stephen had endured multiple weeks of abuse at the hands of his mother. Michelle will describe the moment when Stephen died. She found him in his room, surrounded by vomit, and too weak to hold himself upright. And if I had killed Stephen intentionally, I definitely would be proud to say I did. But I didn't. But I know all the things that I did to him, how I hurt him, I know it did cause his death. You know what I'm saying? It was like that day, the day that he died, I went in his room, it was throw up in front of him on the bed. I got him up. He said he had to go to the bathroom, but he couldn't use the bathroom. By the time we came out the bathroom, his breathing was, it was crazy. Stephen usually has a strong heartbeat, but it was really faint, really, really faint. And then all of a sudden, he just started going like this, and I was holding him. We were both sitting on the floor, and I'm actually holding him up. He couldn't even hold a sip. I'm like Stephen, doing like this, because the day before that, I actually said, I'm going to stop, because I looked in the room, and like, he is toe up. Michelle wrapped Stephen and put him in the deep freezer that was sitting in the middle of their living room. He would remain there for the next two and a half years. I actually was going to turn myself in right after Stephen died. And I told my son, Matthew, that, you know, I, I, I f***ed up. I got to go and I got to go turn myself into the police. I got to go turn myself in. And he said, turn yourself into what? And I said, Matthew, turn myself into the police. That means I got to go because I killed somebody. And then he said, I don't want you to go. When he said that, that was it. So I put Stephen in the freezer and I said, I'm going to stay with my kids as long as possible. Nine months later, Michelle found out that Stoney, the second oldest child who was 13 at the time, was inappropriately touching Matthew as well. It was claimed that Stoney wrung out her menstrual pad in Matthew's mouth. While she took a minute this time to reflect, Michelle will react with extreme rage and began to abuse Stoney. We will hear Michelle discuss the abuse she inflicted on Stoney. I intentionally killed her. How did you do that? Um, starting from the beginning, when I found out about what Stoney was doing to Matthew, it was nine months later after finding out about Stephen. So for the whole nine months we were in the house, she was still raping my child. I did not know that. When I first found out, after Maddie told me, um, I took a minute because I was not understanding, you know, what was, that she did that to him, but um, I repeatedly punched her. On many occasions, my son, I told him to tell me every single thing she did to him. So as she was telling me, he was telling me more and more things that she did. I assaulted her every time he told me what she did to him. Um, by assault, I mean I punched her. I have put a bag over her head till she lost consciousness. Um, I threw hot water on her, scalding hot water from the faucet. 
Um, Did you hit her in the head with a wooden stick? Yes, I hit her in her head multiple times, over and over. Was that shortly before she died? That was actually days before she died and the day she died. I hit her on her back. It's like on her tailbone. Um, I kicked her. I actually had a stick and I was hitting her in the head. Every time he told me something, I hit her very hard in her head and I was throwing hot water on her. Michelle claims that Stoney and Stefan used to abuse Matthew together. In her eyes, both Stoney and Stephen needed to be punished and this was the only way. Eventually, Michelle strangled Stoney to death. Michelle forced her older teenage daughter Gabby, who was in her late teens at the time, to pick up Stoney's body and put it in the freezer on top of Stephen's frozen body. The body of Stoney, age 13, would remain in the living room freezer for about a year and a half before she would be discovered. During her trial, Michelle was asked by the judge if she ever witnessed any of the claimed abuse. Her response was defensive and self-assured. Michelle quickly tried to argue against any doubt the court attempted to raise. Did you ever actually see anything of any sexual abuse of any kind between either Stephen and Stoney and Matthew? I reject her question, but I will answer it because no one will say that this did not happen because it actually did. I just wanted to have a clear record. Because so far, all you've told me was that you just heard it. Did you ever and that they admitted it. it. No, I did okay. not. You okay. get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I understand. But as I went back in my head and thought back to all the many things that was wrong with Matthew over the years, and I'm like, that's what was wrong with you? He used the bathroom and said, Mom, my butt hurts when I poop. I don't know, Matthew. So I started giving him 100% juice to make his stool softer, maybe to help him use the it, That wasn't the problem. It wasn't his stool. It was that he was being wrecked. Basically the same thing. Can I ask you a question first? The people standing behind me, this woman who just asked the question, is she trying to make it seem like this did not happen? No, no, no. no. We just have to have a clear record. Okay. Can this is moment. your time to talk. Go Can ahead. A moment. Well, all we're trying to do is just make sure that the record is clear. Okay. And so don't worry about what behind you. Just do it. Is, I mean, right now, <coughs> ma'am, this is just you choosing to plead guilty. The people do not have any sort of plea agreement. Yeah, because, you know, you it's all. like I'm willing to take a, a polygraph test. It's like, because I understand people don't want to hear me, period, but I'm going to take here, it on everything. The reason Michelle had such a strong reaction and denial of any doubt in her story likely stemmed from her childhood. In a separate interview, Michelle recounted the abuse she endured as a child. She claims a family friend inappropriately touched her when she was very young. When she brought the concern to her own mother, she was rejected. Her mother didn't validate Michelle's feelings about the abuse that she endured. She carried this deep-seated lack of validation and trust into her adult life. We will see her become defensive if she thinks others are questioning her story's legitimacy. This brings us to the question of whether the children's sexual abuse onto one another was true. During Michelle's trial, the prosecution and defense argued both sides of whether the abuse among the siblings took place. No physical evidence was ever found that corroborated Michelle's claims that her children were abusing each other. If the abuse did happen, the question is, where did the children learn it from? Children hardly understand sexuality much less how to perform acts on others without seeing it or hearing about it from somewhere. Michelle herself may have been the source. Michelle didn't want her children to suffer like she did as a child, so she decided to tell them about the inappropriate touching she experienced in order to prevent the same thing from happening to them. She informed her young children about all the abuse she endured as a child in graphic detail. We will hear her recount how she explained this to her children. I told my mother what happened to me. And the only thing she said was, it's over. What you want me to do about it? What do you mean what I want you to do? You get what I'm saying? So all I could do is go back and sit in my room and just sit there and look stupid. I'm a kid. And I'm just telling you what happened to me. You didn't do about it. And plus, I still had to see the person coming in and out of my house. You're still friends with that person. Make sure I told my kids this. I told them what happened to me, how it happened to me, how it made me feel in detail. And I say, if anybody ever touches y'all, you better tell me. They knew. I always talk to my kids about that. That touching from anybody. So they definitely knew. And this is the part that really gets me. I used to tell her 
Rape is the worst thing you can do. Just make y'all tell her all the time. They used to make me feel like I was nothing. It made me feel like I was. You turn around and you do that to my son, you knew exactly what she was doing to him. She knew exactly what she was doing to him. So, yeah, she, man, I don't care what anybody think. She had to go, period. Telling a young child about sexual acts in this type of graphic detail can harm them deeply. This may have been the fuel the children used, either to perform the acts or to fabricate them. It is totally possible the abuse happened, as Michelle described in court. However, what if the abuse didn't happen? Why would a child accept the accusations? While it is important to believe a person that claims to suffer from abuse, especially if the victim is a child, it is also important to ensure the child is not fabricating the abuse, as he or she may not understand the gravity of the situation, especially when their own mother is talking about it in such graphic detail. I had always told my kids, the worst thing you can ever do to somebody is rape them. I always told my son that and I always told the girls the worst thing you could do is cry rape on somebody if they didn't rape you. It may have been that Matthew said his siblings were abusing him to either get back at them knowing how his mother would react or for the sake of attention. Michelle claimed that the children she killed confessed to abusing Matthew, but she also confessed to beating them while questioning them most of the time. They may have simply confessed to make the beating stop. Again, there wasn't any physical evidence to corroborate the claims that the children were sexually abusing one another. But that is not to say that it did not happen. These are simply the arguments the prosecution and defense raised in court. Either way, there is no justification for Michelle's actions. The sexual abuse Michelle endured as a child may have contributed to her violent actions. Michelle's abusive childhood may have led to structural abnormalities of the corpus callosum. And without proper psychological help, it could have very well led to conduct disorder, which is characterized by aggressive, deceptive, and destructive behavior. This would explain her violent reactions toward her children and the many lies she would tell to her family and friends to keep the deaths of her children a secret. Her tendency to disregard the safety of her children and the horrific conditions in which she kept her home. The abuse she inflicted on her children may have also had a cathartic effect it may have been the release of power she always wanted as a child, but never had. Michelle knew that no one protected her growing up, and she believed that killing two of her children was a way to show Matthew that he was protected and loved. This is something she never had as a child. This, my son is eight years old right now. He's gonna forget a lot about me, okay? When he looked back at all this media coverage from these Bible feeders, I don't want him to see that I stood here like a coward. I did what I did, and I did what I did for my baby. Period. He's going to see me standing up, taking my responsibility. I will happily do life in prison for my child. That's period. And I just told you, my son's going to forget a lot of things about me, but he will not forget. He goes on media websites or whatever, looking back over the years. When he is old enough to understand exactly what I did, I want him to look back. He's going to know how important he was and still is to me. I'm happily saying, life in prison. If you had death penalty, I would take that. I don't care. That's my baby. Period. Michelle was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She stated that if Michigan had the death penalty, then she would have wanted to be put to death. Michigan was not only the first state in the U.S. to abolish the death penalty. In fact, it was the first English-speaking government in the world to abolish the death penalty in 1846. During Michelle's sentencing, the judge left no doubt she found Michelle's actions repulsive and condemnable. We will hear the judge's reasons for imposing the maximum sentence she could under the circumstances. As a mother, one of your primary responsibilities was to protect your kids. And in that respect, you failed in the worst possible way. There's nothing that can be done at this point to change what happened. True, that's why I'm asking for life. I know. Uh, thankfully, that house of horrors that you created is no longer in existence. I do pray that your remaining children they will will recover they will from what they saw and endured in that household what struck me as rather unnerving was that you stated that your kids got it better than what you had i fail to see how that's possible when you're still here you're, you're talking here. about you're talking no, about the deceased children not, no let me talk it's you Despite what happened to you when you were a child, you had the opportunity to grow up. True. You had the opportunity to become an adult. You had the opportunity to make your own decisions. 
with respect to running your own life, and you, you were blessed with four children, Stoney and Stephen are never going to have that. They don't have those same opportunities. And when I think about all of the possible joys that they could be missing out on, one thing that strikes me is the greatest tragedy here is that they will never know what a life is like without experiencing fearing their mother. They will never know the joy of what could have been in their life without having you in it. They lived in terrible fear of you. And I find that just so sad in this case. Uh, after all is said and done, you imposed the death penalty on your own children. I did. And you readily admit it, and you want to take responsibility of it. You're therefore sentenced to the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your life without the possibility of parole. Since Michelle had been in jail, she had been charged twice with assaulting guards, and she had over 40 other incidences since 2015. She had been known to get in physical altercations, spit, and throw her urine on fellow inmates in jail. In June 2015, Michell was also in court for a child protective proceeding in relation to her two living children. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services sought to terminate her parental rights along with the parental rights of the two fathers of the children. During this court proceeding, one of Michelle's friends testified against her. The friend stated that she received a concerning text message from Michelle's phone. When she brought it to Michelle's attention, she said that her daughter Stoney sent it. These messages were dated October 2014 and Stoney was killed May 2013, meaning the messages were sent more than a year after her death. Why Michelle would blame her dead child for a text message she clearly sent shows one way that she would try and hide her children's death from others. Michelle would lie to many other people about the whereabouts of her dead children. Again, her children were hidden in the freezer for multiple years, yet no one noticed. Michelle would come up with as many lies as were necessary to keep this a secret. For example, right after Michelle killed Stephen, she pulled all her children out of school. She simply lied to the school that they were moving. She would also lie to the fathers of her children when they tried to see them. This led to the children's complete isolation. When he asked about Stephen, what did you tell him? I told, I told him that he was at my aunt. Right. He, you lied to him? Yes, I did. Do you know the difference between a truth and a lie? Objection. I just, I just told you I lied. Okay, I'm fine. Did you tell the school that Gabrielle and Matthew were not going to attend because they were moving? I did. And was that true? Um, I know the difference between truth and a lie. I definitely lied. Okay. I told them that we were moving because Stephen was dead. August, I'm sorry, in September school would be starting. So, yes, I'm pretty sure they would have been looking for, like, why Stephen missed his school. So, yes. I told them that we weren't coming back because I was moving. When did your relationship with your aunt change? <clears throat> After I found out about what Stephen was doing. Okay. And can you give me a time period for that? Um, that was that was in August. Okay. That was in August of 2012. Okay. And how did your relationship change? Well. I kind of stopped, well, I basically stopped talking to my aunt, period. Um, at one point, she used to come over every day. That's how she was. Like, she loved us. She loved all of us. Like, she checked for us. If one wasn't there, she was looking like, hey, what are they upstairs? I, she loved all of us. And I knew if anybody would know anything was wrong, it would be my aunt. So I purposely kept her away, meaning I was just nasty to her for no reason. You get what I'm saying? And it, it hurt her. That really hurt her because I know she missed me, she missed the kids, but she never stopped coming. She would knock on the door. Sometimes I would open the door like, what? You get what I'm saying? And it hurt me to do that to her because I love that lady, you know? So that's why I took extra care to be that way with my aunt because she was the only one that would really know that something was not right. She, from the moment she walked in that house, she was looking for everybody. She loved us. The only person in my entire life who's ever loved it was ruled that Michelle and Matthew's dad would lose parental rights. This was seen as Matthew's best chance at a bright future since he would be adopted. On the other hand, Gabby's dad was granted parental rights since she was 18 at the time. She would live on her own and would be eligible for two years of court-provided services like therapy, 
schooling, and housing. Although it might seem unfair for an absent father like Gabby's to keep parental rights, the judge did this on purpose, as it would allow Gabby to receive the additional support from the court. When the two surviving children were rescued from Michelle, they were medically examined. There was evidence of physical abuse. Matthew had over 20 scars all over his body, and Gabby, the oldest child, had marks on her as well. The marks were consistent with both children being beaten with an extension cord. Gabby had a cut above her eye and told the medical examiners that she was hit in the head with a 2 by 4 piece of wood. They also noticed she had a broken front tooth. Gabby told them that her mother hit her with a curling iron. Michelle had already beaten and killed two of her children. She thought were being inappropriate, and these are the supposed innocent children in her eyes, and yet she still took out her rage and insecurities on them. In 2015, the same year that the bodies of Michelle's two children were found, Representative Stephanie Chang of Michigan introduced a bill to help prevent parents from hiding child abuse under the disguise of homeschooling. The bill, called House Bill 4498 of 2015, would require parents to register with the school district and meet twice a year to check on the children's well-being. Unfortunately, this bill was never passed by Michigan's House of Representatives. Michigan is one of 11 states that do not require any notice or follow-up contact with the government when a parent pulls a child out of school for homeschooling. In view of the case of Michelle's children, we can hope that one day every jurisdiction will have in place laws to check on the well-being of every child that is homeschooled, so all the suffering of Michelle's children will not be in vain. Do you think Michelle used two of her children's actions as an excuse to be abusive? Did she have an impulsive reaction from her childhood trauma? Thank you for watching and join me next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.